Okay, so with all that preparatory stuff out of the way, uh, we move on today to uh, discussing Rawls directly. Um, now, it's not to say that we didn't actually talk about Rawls last class. In fact, everything we were talking about was stuff that was directly related to Rawls. It's just that we weren't dissecting his view and naming it in the way that he does and so forth. We were sort of beating it around the bush. But today you're going to see how all the stuff that we talked about on Tuesday is actually uh, very clearly to the point. Um, and so, you know, on that note, if you didn't watch Tuesday's video yet, um, more so than ever, to understand and to really get the most out of what's going on today, it's just going to be vital that you go back and watch that lecture uh, before watching this one. Okay, and then just one quick reminder, and that's to take this week's quiz by Saturday. So this is where we left off last time. Um, I, I think one of the last things I said to you is that I suggested that you think about which of the two remaining principles of justice of those five um, that we talked about, which of the two remaining ones is the most rational one to choose when you're in this you know, highly artificial situation of not knowing which person in the society you're going to end up being. Um, and so the question again was, which of those two remaining ones, D or E, uh, was the most rational? Now, <clears throat> uh, hopefully you did think about this and have an opinion. It'll be interesting to contrast your view or your interpretation of the question with the way I'm going to present here. But I do think that the case can be made anyhow that E is clearly the more rational option to select. And if we look back at that simple sample distribution that we spent a fair amount of time discussing last time, it's not going to be hard to see why that is. And so the thing to really highlight here is the fact that in distribution two, um, so, you know, we're talking about, is it principle D or principle E that's the most rational one to, to choose between or behind the veil of ignorance? Corresponding to D would be this distribution, D1, meaning if we thought that, if we thought that principle D right here, was the most rational principle to choose, then we would think that this distribution is the best one, because this is the distribution that principle D requires, the egalitarian one, where everyone's got exactly the same amount. Um, conversely, <clears throat> if we thought that principle E was the most rational one to choose, then it would be this distribution, D2, um, that we would correspondingly think was the optimal or best distribution of the three. Now, so in comparing principles D and E, we're comparing effectively distributions D1 and D2. I'm going to make a case for why principle E is the more rational one by saying that if it's right, this is the distribution we should want. Indeed, this is the distribution we should want. And the way we're going to uh, establish that is by looking at the position of the person who's in the worst um, off uh, position. Uh, because here, the worst off person is the one who has 80, and here, the worst off person is the one who has 75. So if behind the veil of ignorance, I, I'm sorry, I haven't introduced that term yet. If in this highly artificial situation where we don't know who we're going to be in the society, um, we think, well, you know, what would really be best would be to just maximize my chances so that if I'm, if I, if I'm unlucky, if I'm unlucky and I'm the worst person, if I'm the worst off person in that society, I want to be as well off as I can be as the worst off. And that reasoning would lead us to choose D2 because here the worst off person does better than the worst off person here does. So in other words, no matter who you are in this distribution, <clears throat> you're going to be better off than no matter who you are in this distribution. And that seems like it provides a pretty decisive reason in favor of preferring D2 over D1. And in the course of doing so, it, pr it provides a pretty decisive reason for preferring principle E over principle D when we're making this choice, which I've described a ton of times now. But I'll say a little bit more about the reasoning implied here um, on this slide. So why is it that it's the most rational? And this is going to be a little bit redundant, but the basic idea is, you know, option E, it only permits inequalities, whereas option D doesn't permit any inequalities at all. It calls for strict equality. But option E, although it does permit inequalities, 
It only does so if they're beneficial to the worst off members of society. Okay, to so sort of sum up what we were doing last time and how it's going to, and we'll talk about how this is going to bear on what we're doing today when we actually start talking about Rawls, but to sum up what we've just gone over first, if I don't know who I'm going to end up being in some society that I'm uh, planning to enter through this hypothetical thought experiment, um, and I've got to choose between D and E, it's more rational for me to choose E. Because then I know that even if I end up being in the worst off, uh, the worst off member of the society, I'll at least be as well off as I would be under any alternative dis uh, distributive principle. And option D is the one of A, B, C, and D that's still on the table from last time. So that's the one that's relevant. And so this one, we've now eliminated all of the others, <clears throat> is <clears throat> the one that you should choose when you're imagining that you're choosing principle of justice to govern a society that you're about to enter, and when you're rationally, justifiably concerned about what your own welfare will be, and when you don't know who you're going to end up being in that society, so you don't know your race, sex, socioeconomic standing, or the particular talents you might happen to have. Now, up here, um, parenthetically, I said that, you know, option E is what you should choose when these conditions obtain. That is to say, when we're in the psychological thought experiment. But you could also say they're what you would choose. I'm uh, sorry, option E is what you would choose if you're being rational, if you're thinking about this logically. <laughs> okay, so what's, what's the point of all of this? Right? I've just sort of constructed this highly artificial thought experiment for you to consider, and we spent all of last class doing that. Uh, but that really, I, I submit to you, is not a waste of time. It's going to be totally vital in understanding Rawls, and I've chosen this as a way of presenting it because without some kind of presentation like this, I found that nobody knows what the hell's going on. So, um, what we're going to do soon, although not quite yet, is to talk about what this has to do with Rawls. But this question, what's the point, um, what we can say at this exact moment is this. The hypothetical situation we've been discussing and the deprivation of certain kinds of information within it, you don't know what your gender is going to be and all that, that corresponds in a certain way to two concepts that Rawls develops. Okay? And those are called the original position and the veil of ignorance. And these are the two first really important things in Rawls to have a clear grasp on. Fortunately, you're like 90% of the way there if you've already followed uh, what we have talked about so far. But we're going to talk about this more, of course, once we get into Rawls theory itself. Um, and that point in our discussion of Rawls is still a little ways off. However, we are going to begin presently our discussion of Rawls, at least starting from the beginning. And his theory is referred to by himself as uh, a conception of distributed or a conception of justice that he calls the, um, justice as fairness. Now, the question that Rawls is asking in his book, um, a theory of justice, it's called, of which you are reading one small excerpt. That question is this. What should the basic structure of social, political, and economic institutions look like in a just society? Who cares what they look like in an unjust society? We want to know what they look like in a just society. And this is not unlike the question that Nozick himself was uh, addressing. It's a little bit broader because Rawls isn't focusing just on distributive justice, justice with respect to the way wealth and income is distributed, but just uh, justice more broadly, social and political um, as well as economic institutions. Um, having said that, we are going to focus primarily on his remarks on distributive justice. It's what we really want to do is contrast one conception, Nozick's, with another, Rawls's. But in other words, this question comes to the following. What are the fundamental principles of social justice that should structure a good, just society? And <clears throat> Naturally, Rawls provides an answer to this question, and what I'm going to be doing in this lecture is not only talking about what that answer is, but explaining first how he gets there. And that part, believe it or not, is just as important as the answer itself. If you don't understand how he gets there, you're going to be inclined to dismiss his answer as um, fairly radical when it turns out not to be when you see the reasoning that leads him there. What I want to do first is just um, tell you in advance what some of the concepts are that you're going to want to be sure you're clear on by the end of this lecture. So maybe jot these things down on a piece of paper, and then when we're done with all of this, ask yourself, do I know what this is? Do I know what this is? Do I know what that is? 
And if the answer is yes, you're good. If not, you might want to rewind and rewatch some stuff. These um, are them. So first, the original position sometimes gets referred to in the text as the initial situation. Those two phrases mean the same thing. The veil of ignorance. Okay, so those are the two that I already introduced, although I haven't defined. <clears throat> but I did say that they correspond to the kind of hypothetical imaginative stuff we were doing in Tuesday's lecture. And then we've got the two principles of justice themselves that Rawls um, arrives at. <clears throat> and these are going to be uh, the principles that Rawls thinks we would choose in the original position, more on just what that means later. Um, this term primary goods, it's going to be important to know what that means. And then finally, this phrase, the basic structure. I think we'll start out by uh, focusing on these two. First thing to say is that it's just a point of contrast between Nozick and Rawls. So unlike Nozick, Rawls puts the notion of fairness, the importance of this concept of fairness, what it means for a distribution to be fair, he puts that at the center of this question of distributive justice. This question that I said Rawls is trying to ask, right, his answer to it is going to draw, it's going to um, make heavy weather of the concept of fairness, or it's going to put pride of place on the importance of fairness. And that's something that uh, Nozick wasn't concerned with at all. If you just look back at his account, he didn't have any reason to be introducing that. He just had no place in his overall theory. So um, here's this phrase at the top of the screen, the basic structure, and I'm going to define that presently. So Rawls thinks that to think about this distributive problem, Okay, about how to distribute goods within a society, we got to focus on the basic structure of society. So what the hell does that mean? Well, the basic structure of a society is just its main political, legal, and economic institutions. He thinks that's what uh, justice is concerned with, because it's going to turn out to be these institutions that make decisions that affect whether a society turns out to be just or unjust. Um, yeah, so as I say here, these institutions are the, th are the things that determine how goods are, are to be distributed within a society. So if we want to know what the just way is of distributing goods within a society, we got to look at the basic structure, these institutions here, since they're the ones that are concerned with how to distribute them. Hope that makes sense. Now, what goods are we talking about when we say that these institutions determine how to distribute these goods? Well, they include these. Liberties, rights, opportunities, um, who's entitled to run for public office, who's entitled to hold certain positions in government, uh, who's entitled to uh, be hired for certain jobs and other positions and offices. And then, of course, income and wealth. Those are the goods to be distributed. Everything you see on that line there. And in particular, these are goods, sure enough, but we're going to call them social primary goods. What I'm going to do on the next slide is talk about what primary goods are. I'm going to talk about what social primary goods are. I've already given you a pretty good indication of what social primary goods are. I define them as these. But I need to define primary goods when we drop the term social. And I'm going to do one other thing, too. So... Social primary goods okay, can be contrasted with a different kind of primary good, and those are natural primary goods. And natural primary goods are things like intelligence, good health, strength, good looks. Those aren't social goods because they're not things that can be distributed socially. They're things that are distributed naturally. So we've got social goods and primary goods. I've now given you examples of both on this slide for natural and on the previous slide for social. Um, and what justice, with this question of distributive justice, is going to be concerned with um, is going to be the distribution of social primary goods. But even though I've now talked about what social primary goods are, what natural primary goods are, let's forget the social and forget the natural and just give a definition of a primary good. So a primary good, just in perfect generality, is going to be an all-purpose means that it can be used to carry out whatever you happen to want in life. Um, and that's really what it means, as we saw in the last lecture, to say, or, or to refer to 
um, different conceptions of the good that you might have. We've got different conceptions of the good, we've got um, different things that we want in life, and primary goods are going to be the things that we use to get what we want. So we're going to use these things to get what we want, these natural primary goods, and we're going to use these things to get what we want, these social primary goods. The primary goods in general are things that everyone wants more of rather than less. And so, for better or for worse, uh, society, the basic institutions of society, society's basic structure, is only capable of distributing the social ones. All right. Now, what we need to do here, our main task, is to figure out how the social primary goods should be distributed by the basic structure of society. That is to say, we need to identify principles of justice that apply to the basic structure of society and tell us how to distribute those social primary goods. Now, here are some kind of facts on the ground, some basic, empirical, uncontroversial facts that are going to serve as starting points for Rawls's project. He doesn't think any of this is controversial, just some things to note and that are important to note. First is that in a society, everyone is self-interested. Right? That doesn't mean totally cold-hearted selfish. It just means we're all concerned about our welfare, as we should be. We're all concerned about how things go for us. And um, that's totally justifiable. In itself, that's fine. But, however, there is a real tendency here for this to lead to unjust distributions. And so, Rawls isn't saying that we should be selfless or altruistic instead of being self-interested when we think about what justice requires. After all, your own interests, my own interests, they matter to me just as everyone else's matter to them. So yes, I should totally be concerned with uh, my own interests, my own welfare. But he is saying that we need a way to keep this self-interestedness self in check when we're looking for the correct principles of justice, because if we all just go for what's best for me, screw everybody else, if we take it too far, it's going to lead us astray when um, we start looking uh, for the, the correct principles of justice. Now we can refer to this as uh, the bias problem, as I do on this slide. To put it a little bit differently, different citizens in a society have different and conflicting economic interests. Okay? That's just a fact. And different citizens have different and conflicting conceptions of the good. We have different things that we value in life, different things that we want. And that's fine. Okay? But each citizen has a tendency, a natural unavoidable tendency, to press or to push for principles of justice that are going to benefit him or her. That's just a, a sort of sociological fact, as well as a psychological fact, I suppose. And we've got to overcome that standpoint bias if we want to answer this question in a way that works and can be justified, that works for everybody, that is to say that can be justified to each member of society as something that's fair. And in order to do this, we got to be imaginative, okay? We've got to imagine a bias-free standpoint, one that's impartial with regard to these conflicting interests that we have. Okay, and so if you start thinking at this point about what we talked about back on Tuesday, you should start to see how the stuff we did then is tying in now, but if not, I'll make it uh, crystal clear here shortly. And this imaginative standpoint is going to help us overcome this standpoint bias is exactly what Rawls's original position aims to do. So the original position is a device that Rawls uses to overcome this standpoint bias that must be overcome if we're going to reach the correct principles of justice, as opposed to the principle of justice that would say, if I'm the one advancing it, only those who um, have beards get uh, any of the wealth in a society, right? So this original position, which I've already indicated is sometimes referred to as the initial situation, is an abstract, that is to say hypothetical, and non-historical construct. Okay? And it corresponds more or less directly to what we did in the last lecture when we introduced this elaborate imaginative exercise. 
First, a remark on what it means to be abstract and hypothetical, and what it means to be non-historical. Um, note first that what we did last time is we simply imagined that we're all trying to decide which principles to choose to govern our society. Remember, that's the way I set that whole thing up. I said, imagine we're all you know, getting together, sitting down, trying to figure out uh, what principles are going to govern this new society that we're starting, right? And that was an imaginative exercise. We weren't really getting together to figure out what principles there were. And so in that sense, it's abstract and hypothetical. And it's non-historical in the sense that Rawls doesn't think that any such meeting ever happened in the history of this society or any other society. No, he's not, um, you know, brain dead, okay? So he is not saying something like this ever did happen or should happen in any physical sense of us getting together and having this debate. He's saying it's a hypothetical, imaginative exercise that I can carry out, you can carry out, never happened in history, never will happen in history, but it's still going to be important um, to his theory. And this imaginative exercise, called the original position, includes a veil of ignorance. That's the second key term that we defined, or that we put up on the screen earlier and are now defining. And what the veil of ignorance does is it comes into place in the process of executing this imaginative exercise. And what it does is it excludes from consideration any knowledge of your race, sex, current economic position, talents you might have or might not have, and what your conception of the good is, what you think is valuable in a life, what's worth pursuing. So think back about Tuesday's lecture here too. In the second part of it, I said, okay, we're, you know, in the first part I said, we're all getting together and trying to figure out which principles to accept in this, in this new society of ours, and just choose the one that you think is best for you. Then I sort of turned it on its head and said, all right, we're still in this, you know, hypothetical situation where we're trying to figure out what principles are best for our society, but now you can't, you need to do this without thinking about what your race is, what your sex is, your current economic position, or any of this stuff, because you don't know who you're going to end up being in this society. Well, that part of the original position, this veil of ignorance, that's just something that says, here's what's off limits when you're making the decision. We're putting a veil or a sort of, you know, uh, facade in place. We're, we're, we're putting up a, a kind of curtain uh, behind which we have no access to the real facts about ourselves, about what race we happen to be, what sex we happen to be. And that's going to make this deliberation in this imaginative exercise about thinking about the correct principle of justice, that's going to make that deliberation bias-free. It's going to make it an impartial standpoint. It's going to allow us to overcome this bias problem. Okay? So to sum up just that part that we were just most recently talking about, here's Rawls's thought. Okay, Given this bias problem I just defined, if we're trying to figure out the correct or non-biased principles of justice, we need to do so from the perspective of the original position. And that was the imaginative exercise where, we, where we're imagining that we're all jointly choosing what principles are going to end up governing our society. And we should do so from behind this veil of ignorance where certain facts about who we're going to end up being in the society are um, blocked off from us. Well, why is it that that's what we should do if we want to um, get around this bias problem? Well, it's just this. Since we're all concerned to further our own interests, and since that fact is likely to contaminate our choice of principles of justice, at least to some degree, and our goal is to arrive at the right ones, what we should do is deprive ourselves of some of the, that information that's biasing us. And that's what this should accomplish. In particular, that's what the veil of ignorance will accomplish. But you might still wonder, well, why should we all agree to enter the original position? And the thought's just that we should agree to do that if we're concerned about fairness. Now, if you're not concerned about fairness, if you don't think that justice has anything to do with what's fair, then there'd be no reason to, to mess with all of this our original position and this veil of ignorance in particular. Right? But if you do care about fairness, and there's a good case to be made for thinking that you should, you should enter the original position when deliberating about the correct principles of justice. 
And that's because the original position is a fair bargaining position. We're bargaining with each other about which principles to adopt in, um, for our society. And um, it's a fair one because uh, it deprives us of the information that is likely to bias us. Okay, and these two, if you want to pause and look at these two bullets, that's fine, but it basically covers what I just said. Now, okay, a little bit about the motivation of the parties in the original position. Um, it's a hypothetical imaginative exercise, so really when I'm thinking about this, I'm the only party in the original position. I'm the only one who is thinking, um, okay, I don't know anything about who I'm going to be in the society, but uh, let me think about what the correct principles of justice would be on that supposition. Okay. But So I'm a party in the original position. You are whenever you engage in that imaginative exercise. But what we do know from when we talked about this last time is that when you're in that original position, even though the the veil of ignorance is in place, you do know that whoever you are, you're going to have some conception of the good, and see the last lecture for more on that, and that whatever your conception of the good is, it's always going to be better to have more, uh, rather than fewer, primary goods. So the difference between this slide in the last class and this slide in the current lecture is that I replaced resources and income and wealth with primary goods. Um, now that we know what the term primary goods means as Rawls uses it in his essay. So, the next major piece of information to have on the table here is what Rawls calls the maximin decision rule. And in particular, Rawls thinks that when we are in the original position in that imaginative exercise, the rule that we're going to fall back on in making decisions about the correct principles of justice is going to be this maximin decision rule. So I need to define that. And the reasoning behind it, before giving an actual definition, is precisely the reasoning that I tried to illustrate when I walked you through how we would arrive at option E as opposed to options A, B, C, or D in the last lecture and in the beginning of this lecture when we had it narrowed down to just options D and E. So remember, I, I walked us through that and I said, well, we wouldn't choose option A for this reason, we wouldn't choose option B for this reason, and in doing so, I was re relying implicitly, without naming it, I was relying on uh, this maximum decision rule. So now I'm gonna bring this full circle. What this maximum de uh, decision rule says is this, always maximize the worst off possibility. Why? Because for all you know, once that veil of ignorance is in place, you could end up be occupying the worst off position in that society. So the rule that's the most rational to rely on in choosing a principle, Rawls says, is the rule or the, the reasoning that tells you to maximize the, the position of the worst off person in the society or the worst off group. And that's what the maximum decision rule tells us to do. Um, and to put it a little bit differently, the reason for employing this rule is that we're under conditions of radical uncertainty, given the way that the original position and the veil of ignorance have been deliberately laid out and set up. We're deliberately and purposefully, and with good reason, under conditions of radical uncertainty. We don't know who we're going to be in a society. And under such conditions, the most reasonable rule to rely on as a way of governing the choices we're going to make is one that maximizes the position of the one in the worst off position. And that's what the maximum uh, rule tells us to do. So since we've got no idea who we're going to end up being, our number one priority, according to this rule, is to be as risk-aversive as possible. To be as risk-averse as possible, I should say. And that's just because we could end up occupying that worst-off position in society. Now one thing I had up last time, which I'm going to put up again, uh, but with the new jargon that we've incorporated, is this. Imagine yourself as a rational agent 
in the original position. And you got to try to choose from behind a veil of ignorance the type of society that you'll be placed in. All that you know is that you want to protect your own interests, whoever you turn out to be in that society. And which society would be rational uh, for you in this situation to choose? That is to say, which principle of justice that's going to end up defining what the society is like uh, is the one that's the most rational for you to choose. And here are those possibilities from last time. I'm not going to go through all these again. That was from the last lecture. But Rawls has two kind of central claims about the, the original position in the Veil of Ignorance that lead us to kind of the next big question we've got to tackle. And those are these. First, that people choosing from behind a veil of ignorance in the original position would choose something like the structure of society represented in option E over all the others. I'm not going to say anything more about why that's so, because that's exactly what I took all that time to do in Tuesday's lecture. It's important that you understand all of that stuff, but I'm just not going to waste your time by going over it again now. <clears throat> but here's the second thing we haven't touched on yet, and that's Rawls's claim that the fact that people would choose option E okay, implies that the principles within option E are the ones that are the most just or the most fair. And that second claim, what I've labeled two here, is somewhat mysterious. Because, you know, how can we conclude that, they, that these are the correct principles, that these are the most just or most fair principles, just because they're the ones that we would choose if we were engaged in this bizarre um, situation where we're imagining we're choosing the principles to govern our new society and we don't know anything about ourselves because uh, we're behind a veil of ignorance. Let me try to explain a little bit more. <clears throat> you know, you might think, all right, Rawls, maybe you've convinced me that I would choose option E if I was doing all this crazy stuff, like I'm doing this imaginative exercise where I pretend I don't know anything about myself. But why does the fact that I would choose option E mean that option E is the most just? And, and so there is a leap here. There, there is a leap in the inference that Rawls makes from one to two. And it's not a leap in judgment that has no good reason. It's just something that's not quite clear at first. And so what I want to do next, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time doing this, is explaining how the transition in logic from one to two is supposed to take place. And the answer to this question, why is it that Rawls thinks that the fact that there are certain principles that we would choose behind the veil of ignorance means that those very principles are the ones that are just. And the answer, to put it in its simplest, although by no means its clearest terms, is this. He combines a contractualist idea with a certain equivalence claim. Now, I need to warn you that at this point in the lecture, more so than anywhere else, we're going to be dealing with some somewhat technical stuff. I'm going to try to dumb it down, as it were, uh, which is appropriate because it's difficult, um, a little bit later on, but I want you to try to follow hard what's going on here. So this contractualist starting point uh, that I referred to here is this. In trying to discover what justice is, what we're looking for is a legitimate set of principles to govern the basic structure and in institutions of a free society. We've already seen that. And a free society is one where there's a system of cooperation in place among free and equal persons. What does that mean? Well, a society isn't a bunch of people living totally separately, and this isn't just some like hippie observation. A society really is a cooperation among free and equal persons. We would have no such thing as a mature capitalist economy without cooperation between people. 
um, you know, some degree of cooperation is required in order in, in a free society. And also, such a society is composed of free and equal persons. This isn't terribly controversial, but if there's any doubt about it, um, you can just refer to the, you know, uh, you know, your old, you know, founding fathers and what they had to, you know, say about this. And a set of principles for such a society is going to be morally legitimate, because remember, that's what we're looking for, if and only if, so only when, those principles can be justified to each and every person in that society. Why do they have to be justified to each and every person in the society? Because they're each free and equal. And only then will it be reasonable to expect them all to accept such principles and to live under the system that uh, puts them forth. So to put it differently, just principles are going to be the ones that we could reasonably expect all reasonable people to accept as the principles that govern them within that society. So this is the contractualist starting point, which is going to be one of the two ingredients, the other being this equivalence claim we haven't defined yet, that's necessary to answer our question about why Rawls thinks that the principles that we would choose from behind the veil of ignorance are automatically the just or correct principles. Okay. Now you might ask, and Rawls does, how can a set of principles meet that condition? This condition of being principles that we could reasonably expect all reasonable people to accept as the principles governing them when all those people are free and equal. Okay. And the answer to that is where the second part comes in, this equivalence claim, which recall was the second ingredient in answering this question. Okay, and that equivalence claim says this. A set of principles can be justified to each and every person as something it is reasonable for him or to accept, which is what we just saw we needed with the uh, uh, contractualist claim, if and only if, only when, those principles would be chosen in the original position and from behind the veil of ignorance. And so we then ask, well, why do you say that? Why do you say that the principles um, that uh, would be justified to each and every person as something they could accept as reasonable would be the ones that could be chosen from behind the veil of ignorance in the original position? Why do you say that? Well, because of this. Choosing principles out of ra rational self-interest, but from behind the veil of ignorance, is equivalent to choosing principles with full knowledge in a way that fully respects all other persons as free and equal beings. So if you choose in a self-protective way, which is what we do, uh, as we saw on Tuesday when we did that exercise originally, when you do that, when you choose in a self-protective way, while also not knowing who you'll turn out to be in the society, that's the same as choosing in a way that's fair and respectful of everyone's equal value, which in turn will result in something that everyone can reasonably accept. Okay, so the upshot here is that if we, um, as long as we accept the axiom that I'm about to put up on the next slide, um, this equivalence claim here turns out to be true. What's that axiom? It's this. All members of society are free and equal persons in the sense of having equal basic human worth and dignity. So any legitimate set of principles must treat people as free and equal beings. He calls this an abs axiom because it's just a self-evident truth in the way that the founding fathers thought it was. It's an axiom because he's not going to argue in support of it. He just thinks you should already know this. <clears throat> so here's the point. Okay. The original position, when the veil of ignorance is in place, it models or takes account of people's equal basic value. The fact 
as this axiom says, that people are free and equal beings. Okay, it models that into the choice situation, the original position, for choosing the principles. And that makes it a fair one that respects everyone's equal moral worth. Okay, and the way that it does that, again, is by screening off morally arbitrary factors like socioeconomic status, race, gender. It screens that stuff off from the decision procedure, from the original position. And then just one kind of asterisk here, self-interested choice from behind the veil of ignorance is equivalent to a fair choice from the perspective of justice, because it takes everyone's evil worth seriously. Now, that was a lot to process. I understand that. So what I'm going to do now is try to kind of dumb this down, if you will, in two different ways. So here is the first way. Okay. If those are the principles of justice that you choose when you're behind the veil of ignorance, namely what corresponded to option E, then by definition, that means that those are the principles you would choose when you're not taking your own biased perspective into account. Why? Because the original position didn't let you take your own biased perspective into account, and the way it did that was by putting up the veil of ignorance. We might say alternatively that those are the principles you choose when you're not allowing knowledge of your own gender, race, socioeconomic status, or anything else that's morally arbitrary, and you're not allowing that sort of stuff to influence your choice. Now, suppose you want to say, yeah, those are the principles I choose in that situation when you forced me to forget everything about myself, everything that makes me me. But they're not the principles that are required by justice, you might contend. And the thought's just this. Wait, how could that be? Justice means fairness, and that's precisely what we've guaranteed with the veil of ignorance. You know, we had you imagine that you didn't know anything about who you were going to be in the society. That is the very definition of a fair bargaining situation. If that's not fair, then what is? Okay. And if it's a fair bargaining situation, then the principles you arrive at in it will be fair, and that means that they'll be just, because justice is fairness. The second way of kind of putting this in simpler terms is as follows. Things like race, socioeconomic status, gender, your own particular, particular talents, all that stuff is arbitrary from the moral point of view. Those are all what we might call morally arbitrary factors. That is to say, considerations that are just arbitrary or irrelevant from a moral point of view. You know, you, I'm sure, agree that when I said this principle of justice would be a bad one, only distribute wealth to those with beards, right? That's a personal characteristic that would be screened off or eliminated from contention behind the veil of ignorance. Why? Because it's a morally arbitrary factor, and that's what the veil of ignorance uh requires us to disregard. Okay, so all of those are things that are arbitrary from a moral point of view. We shouldn't be making decisions about the correct principles of justice on the basis of such things. And you know, to take another example, only white people get a share of the cooperative surplus or the money that's left over um, that we have to possibly redistribute um, uh, to, to those who are less fortunate, right? Only white people get that. Okay? Um, that would be an unjust principle. It would be grossly unjust. But the veil of ignorance, one last time, just screens off or removes from consideration, or forces us to ignore just those factors. So surely the principles you choose from behind that veil of ignorance are the ones that are just. Okay, so that's the basic picture. Now, what is it exactly that this original position with the veil of ignorance in place, what is it that it tells us to choose as the correct principles of justice? Last time I talked about that as uh, what was represented or captured by option E as opposed to options A, B, C, or D. But that's not exactly how Rawls put it. He didn't put it as option E, blah, 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 blah. I tried to capture it informally that way, but what are the principles that Rawls thinks we would choose explicitly from uh, the original position? There's going to be two of them. 
The first is this. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberties compatible with a similar liberty for others. What that means is everyone gets equal basic liberties. Everyone has the right to vote. Everyone has the right to hold public office. Everyone has the right not to be discriminated against at a job interview and so forth. Okay, so equal ones and, as this part says, the most extensive ones that we could have as long as everybody gets them. And then the second principle, a little bit more complicated, says that socioeconomic structures must be designed to allow general significant inequalities, okay, so differences between us, only when those inequalities are attached to positions and offices open to all, and that there's fair equality of opportunity, meaning basically take two equally bright young people, each of them should have an equal opportunity to hold some public office, for instance. So this part says, you know, no discrimination, if there's going to be any inequalities at all. And the second part of the second principle says that these inequalities need to be, it needs to be reasonable to expect them to be to everyone's advantage, everyone's advantage. But in particular, they need to be to the advantage of the worst off group than any of the alternatives available. Okay, so what I'm going to do on this next slide is just rephrase these Rawls's two principles of justice um, in a slightly different way and uh, illustrate how they're supposed to work. So, the first, the equal liberty principle is what we'll call it, and it says that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty that's compatible with a similar liberty for others. And what I want to do first, before moving on to the second principle, is to look at how it is that this maximin reasoning we've already discussed favors the equal liberty principle. Why it is, in other words, that, we're, that when we're reasoning uh, from the perspective of the maximin principle, we get the equal liberty principle. And it works like this. So suppose that we've got three groups of people in our society, and of course we have many more than this, um, Hindus, Jews, and um, so forth, but Christians, Muslims, and atheists. And suppose that Christians, as I think they most certainly do, value equality for Christians more than they value equality for Muslims or atheists. Muslims, similarly, are going to value, they're going to value equality for themselves more than they are for Christians or atheists, and atheists are going to value equality for themselves more than they are for Muslims or Christians. But the best worst option for all three groups is equal religious liberty. Okay? Because if you don't know whether you're going to turn out to be a Christian, a Muslim, or an atheist, you know you'll turn out to be one of them. But if you're using the maximum reasoning, which is to uh, maximize the opportunities for whoever turns out to be in the minority, or whoever turns out, right, and so we don't know in society who's going to turn out to be in the minority. Um, according to that reasoning, the best thing you can do for yourself is to have equal liberty for everyone. And so it's in that sense that when we follow this maximum reasoning, which is exactly what we followed when we evaluated options A, B, C, D, and E on Tuesday's lecture, we have to choose equality for everybody, which is exactly what the equal liberty principle says. It's the least risky. And I think very plausibly it's the just principle as well. But what Rawls is doing is saying that the reason it's the just principle 
is because that's what you would choose, veil of ignorance, when you didn't know whether you were going to turn out to be a Christian, Muslim, or atheist. And then we could do a similar kind of exercise for the second principle of justice, which is this, the difference principle, which says social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are maximally beneficial to the worst off group. We've already talked about what that, um, what that principle says, but uh, you need to recall that it's referred to by Rawls as the difference principle. And I will talk about why it is that Maximin reasoning favors that principle as well as the first principle. And this is something really I've already done. By way of very quick recap, the idea is I, if I want to maximize the opportunities for the worst off position in society, given that I could be in that position, I want to choose according to the difference principle. And that says maximize the prospects for uh, those who are worst off in the society. And here, um, that's going to be the people on this row. Okay. So in a pretty straightforward way, maximum in reasoning also favors uh, the selection of the difference principle. And for that matter, at a more basic level, we can see that what the difference principle says really is almost identical to what the maximum principle says. You'll recall the difference principle says that social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are maximally beneficial to the worst off group, whereas the maximum principle said that under conditions of radical uncertainty, which we are in when we're behind the veil of ignorance, we should always maximize the uh, position of the worst off group. <laughs> So just a couple uh, more remarks on this. D2 is the distribution that you would select in the original position behind the veil of ignorance. Hopefully that's been established. And Rawls also thinks that it's the most just distribution. And the difference principle, we might say, just merely reveals the reasoning that we implicitly use when we choose D2 over the others in the original position. What it does is it tells us to choose D2, but really, we could see at any time what distribution to choose when presented with options either by consulting that difference principle or just by entering the original position and putting up the veil of ignorance. It's going to come to the same thing. All right, now one of the final things I want to do uh, in this <coughs> lecture um, is to talk about whether our actual socioeconomic system in this country satisfies those two principles of justice we've just looked at. And I want to do this by looking at them separately. So first, the difference principle, we can ask whether this is satisfied in the US. Now, it's just a merely empirical fact that there are massive inequalities in wealth. Recently, we talk, talked about Paul Allen, right? And according to the difference principle, inequalities at all, not to mention massive inequalities, are going to be just only if the worst off people would be even worse off if those inequalities didn't exist. So again, the difference principle says that inequalities are okay, we don't have to have strict egalitarianism, but only if the people who were the very worst off would be even more screwed if there were no inequalities at all. So maybe pause to make sure you understand this particular rewording of what the difference principle says. So we want to ask, is that the case in this society, right? Is it the case that the people in this society who are the very worst off would be even more screwed if there were no inequalities at all? Um, we just have to ask that question, and the answer is no. Um, it seems like a distribution of wealth, like ours, where Paul Allen has amassed that um, 200 million dollar yacht or enough wealth uh, to make that purchase um, no big deal, right? A distribution where that's possible and yet where there are more than half a million homeless people, okay, that kind of distribution that we have is clearly not one where the worst off people would be even worse off if the inequalities did not exist. It seems very difficult to accept 
that the half a million homeless people, I think actually 600,000, in this country would be even more screwed if Paul Allen didn't have so much money that he was able uh, to purchase a $200 million yacht without batting an eye. Or just more generally, inequalities like this are not working to the advantage of the very worst off people in the sense that those very worst off people would be better off if those inequalities didn't exist in the first place. That's because if those inequalities didn't exist, if we were to revert back to what the default was, option D, egalitarianism, then those worse off people would be much better off. They wouldn't be homeless. So for this reason, our actual society bears no resemblance to what Rawls thinks a society looks like when it's governed by the correct principles of justice. So here's a thought, right? Let's just use equal distribution of wealth, egalitarianism, option D from last time. Use that as our starting point. Say, well, that would at least be somewhat just, as opposed to the principle, I think it was principle A, where we just distribute wealth to those of us who were white men. Okay, so strict egalitarianism, equal distribution of wealth, that's at least going to be somewhat just. So let's use that as our frame of reference, our starting point. Now the difference principle is going to say, it's okay to deviate from that. We don't have to be egalitarians. We can have some people who are much more wealthy than others, but only when doing so makes those who are in the least favorable position better off than they would be if we reverted back to egalitarianism, back to our starting point, and everyone simply had exactly the same amount of wealth. Now, I'm gathering that many of you don't like the sound of this. That's always been my uh, sense when I've taught this in the past in person. So I want to push back on that intuition a little bit. Because what Rawls is saying is that this is exactly how you yourself would reason from the original position and from behind the veil of ignorance. Now I illustrated that last time with options A through E. I said, when we're behind the veil of ignorance, we don't like any of these other ones. We like option E when we don't know if we're going to end up being a millionaire or could be a millionaire. And so I suggest that you probably only dislike this result here where these kinds of inequalities in wealth are only okay if it makes the very worst off even better off probably don't like that only because you live in an actual society where you're not forced to make that decision from behind the veil of ignorance in the original position. And the, the thought is that you know one reason in support of the difference principle is just that it's the principle you yourself would choose if you were rational, which we're assuming you all are, and if you weren't factoring in facts about yourself that are irrelevant from a moral point of view. That is, if you were making the decision from behind the veil of ignorance. But as, of, as we've already hinted at, Rawls has another argument in support of the difference principle. Okay, so if that didn't convince you, perhaps this will. The distribution of wealth, income, opportunities, those are things that should not be based on factors for which people can claim no credit. What we're saying is distributive justice, the principles that we use to govern that, shouldn't be based on things for which people can claim no real credit. Now why is that? Just because those factors like, you know, race, sex, gender, socioeconomic standing, talents you happen to have, those things are arbitrary from a moral point of view. Well, so what that they're arbitrary from a moral point of view? Well, what we're doing here at bottom is we're looking for the correct principles of justice. And so clearly we shouldn't be consulting things that are morally irrelevant. And it's precisely that insight that led all of us, um, or would lead all of us if we were pressed, um, to reject what we'll call a feudal aristocracy. If you're not familiar with that term, um, what it means is this. Well, 
a feudal aristocracy is going to be one where being born into a noble family is what determines single-handedly your life's prospects. Those who aren't are pretty much screwed. So I think we all reject the idea, the, the socio-political economic system of feudal aristocracy. We reject it, and the reason that we do so is that being born into a noble family is morally irrelevant. It's not a good basis for making decisions about who has access to wealth and opportunity. So it seems like this is a case where all of us adopt the reasoning factors that are arbitrary from a moral point of view are irrelevant to selecting the principles of justice. Okay. We all adopt that view there, and that leads us to reject a feudal aristocracy. So maybe instead of a feudal aristocracy, that moves us to a straight-up free market system where careers and opportunities are open to talents, but which takes um, to be just any distribution of income and wealth that results from free exchange. So the difference between a feudal aristocracy and a free market system is that you can get ahead if you're talented. You don't have to be born into a noble family. Okay. One upshot, however, of a free market system like Nozick's libertarian view is that any distribution will be just so long as it results from free exchange. But what Rawls is going to say about this is the same thing he's going to say about a feudal aristocracy and the reason why that's no good. He says that's not going to be fair or just either. It's going to be biased not in terms of whether you're a noble family or not, but rather it's going to be biased in favor of those who happen to be born into affluent families and those who happen to have good educational opportunities. Those are going to be the things that um, give you the opportunity in a free market system to get ahead. And that, those things are accidents of birth. And they're just not a basis for um, distributing life chances because they're equally morally arbitrary. They're equally morally relevant, just like being born into a noble family was. Okay, maybe that moves us, um, or, or that convinces us to move from a free market system to a meritocratic system or a meritocracy. And that's going to be um, a system where Everyone is raised to the same starting point in the beginning of life. Okay? Everyone's got equal opportunities. Everyone's got um, maybe an equal starting point of wealth. But then it's all about hard work. So whatever you make of yourself in your own talents combined with your hard work is going to be allowed by such a system. That is to say, whatever distribution results from such a system that will be considered just. But Rawls is going to have gripes about this too for the same reason as the other two. He's going to say, look, if we were bothered by the idea of a feudal aristocracy because it seems to allocate income, wealth, and opportunity on morally arbitrary grounds, basically a social lottery where you happen to be born into socially, what caste system, if we were bothered by that, then we should also be bothered by the idea of a meritocracy. Okay, because that's going to allow income, wealth, and opportunity to be based on morally arbitrary factors as well. Here, it won't be a social lottery, but it'll be a natural lottery. It'll be luck based on what natural um, goods, natural primary goods, you happen to be in doubt with. Um, how much, you know, what your talents are, um, how hardworking you are, what your work ethic is like. Now at this point you might be saying, look, this guy's really going off his rocker here. So I want to try to reel it back in a little bit and explain why he thinks something like this. So some people happen to be born with more talents than others. I think that's just a datum. That's something we have to accept as true. And some people happen to be born with better genetics than others, uh, more intelligence. And for that reason, they're able to make more of themselves their opportunities, and hence income and wealth, are going to be enlarged. But those things, those talents or even genes, those aren't something we're responsible for either. And so they're not something that we have a moral claim to. They're going to turn out to be morally arbitrary as well. No less morally arbitrary than happen to being born into a noble family and living in a society where, that's what's get re where that is what gets rewarded. 
So what do we do then if we want to eliminate inequality based on morally arbitrary factors? Well, Rawls says we don't want to handicap those born with intelligence. Okay? We don't want to handicap those born with more psychological determination or a better disposition to work hard. That would be unjust. So we're not going to handicap them. In fact, we should allow them to exercise those gifts and should even encourage them to do so. That's how we have a good, prospering society. But what we should do is to allow them to benefit from their good fortune, the luck of that natural lottery, only on terms or on conditions that benefit the least well-off in the way that the difference principle says. So, as an illustration, Paul Allen can make his billions according to Rawls, but we shouldn't pretend that he morally deserves those billions, as though he's morally responsible for these things. His genetic disposition to work hard and persevere, his genetic gift of intelligence, his good fortune to have met Bill Gates, or his good fortune to have been born here rather than in Africa. So what Rawls is saying is that somebody like Paul Allen, we don't want to handicap him prevent him from doing the good things that he does, the good use he makes of his talents. But we don't either want to say that he morally deserves or is somehow responsible for the stuff on this list. So Rawls thinks what we're going to want to do is tax his billions and give it specifically to those who are the least well off so that the difference principle is satisfied. And that leads us um, to choose a principle uh, that tells us to do that, and that's the difference principle. And that's what we would do if we were behind the veil of ignorance um, and in the original position. And since that's what we would choose there, that's what justice requires. All right, now you still might not buy that last bit, <clears throat> and so I'm going to address some objections to Rawls and his responses to those, some of which will focus on just that last bit we were talking about, and we're almost done here. So these are both going to be objections to the difference principle. Um, the first is this. Well, look, what about incentives? Okay, this is something students are really fond of pointing out, and I think with good reason, right? If taxes are high enough, then Paul Allen isn't going to be motivated to keep developing software and hardware, or even start Microsoft in the first place. Okay. And that seems, in the face of it, to be a pretty reasonable objection to raise. I think, however, that uh, Rawls has a a good natural response to this that should cover this objection. He could say, like, look, if taking too much from Paul Allen would, as you say, cause him not to work, then one thing that would do is it would hurt the worst off because we wouldn't then be able to redistribute any of that wealth to them to make them better off than they would otherwise be. So, Rawls is gonna say, in order to avoid that, We'll just tax Paul Allen only to the point just before those incentives are lost. We'll tax him, but only so much that he'll continue to keep doing the stuff that he does that we want him to do. So I'd be interested to see what you guys have to say about that. Definitely chime in on the discussion board if you're up to the challenge. And then the second objection I want to raise to Rawls and offer his response to is this. You might say, well, what about the idea that people have a right to what they earn because they worked hard for it? And this is another objection I've countered time and time again in teaching this material. So again, look, don't people have a right to what they earn because they worked hard for it? You can't just take that, take a sizable chunk of that away from them in order to follow the difference principle and benefit those who are in the worst off position. But I think Rawls actually has two responses to this. The first one is this. Again, even effort and work ethic depend upon family circumstances that are fortunate, and there are things for which you can claim no credit. Okay, And there are things which are thereby arbitrary from a moral point of view. And I'll give you a good example to support this claim that's made in this response to the objection. There's been some interesting psychological research emerge on the connection between birth order and work ethic, and in particular they found that firstborn children are much more likely to have a strong work ethic than, uh, than second-born children. Um, for those of you who are uh, second or third or 
or whatever born. Um, this is, of course, just a generalization. There are always exceptions to the rule, so don't get too depressed. Um, but it is true that, in general, uh, firstborn children tend to have a much better work ethic than secondborn children. I know that to be the case in a lot of um, situations. Now, do we want to say, given that, because of, you know, taking that into account, do we want to say that one's work ethic is really something, you know, how hard they work, is that really something that they deserve credit for? Is it really correct to say that you've got a right to what you earn because you worked hard for it, when apparently how hard you're willing to work for it has a lot to do with something that's entirely outside of your control, right? How you were, not just how you were raised, but something as absurd as the order in which you were born, right? Okay, and then the second sort of objection is going to be that, or the second sort of response to the objection is this. Again, that objection was, what about the idea that people have a right to what they earn because they worked hard for it? And Rawls could say, look, you don't really believe that what you deserve is a product of effort. So this is going to be a second distinct response from this one. But it's going to kind of come to the same thing. Saying, look, you don't really believe that anyway, that what you deserve is a product of effort. <clears throat> I'll give you an example to show you why. So take two construction workers, all right? One of them is strong physically and he can raise four walls in an hour without even breaking a sweat. Take a second construction worker who's small and scrawny, and he's got to spend three days to do the same amount of work to raise four walls. All right. Now, no defender of meritocracy, no defender of the view that what you deserve is a function of how hard you work or how much effort you devote. Not even that person is going to look at those two construction workers and say, oh, well, the weaker one, he put in a lot more effort. It took him, um, you know, three days, whereas the other, other guy only um, did it in an hour. No one's going to say, because the scrawny one put in a lot more effort, he deserves to earn more. Okay. In fact, if anything, I mean, you might think that the guy who took much longer to do the same amount of work is just less efficient. And maybe should be paid even less, deserves even less, right? So if the thought was supposed to be that what you deserve is a product of your effort, and so it would be wrong to tax people for their hard work, then you'd be committed to something absurd that you probably won't want to be committed to. And the upshot here, again, is just that effort isn't really the moral basis of what you deserve. Okay, one final thing, and that's that I think that ultimately, for any objection you're going to raise to the difference principle, which had those unsavory implications on the previous, um, uh, on a few slides back, Rawls wouldn't have to respond in the two ways I just put up. Okay, because I think ultimately, to any such objection, what he's going to say is this. Oh, okay, so you don't like the way that the difference principle liberally redistributes wealth to the worst off in a society? Well, then why the hell did you pick it in the original position and from behind the veil of ignorance. Because I think if you're like most people, you did pick it from uh, behind the veil of ignorance. And we were talking about that on Tuesday in an informal way, and when we followed up with it today, when we actually started talking about Rawls. The difference principle is the principle that gets us the most safe, the, less, the least risky, uh, distributions, which is what we want from behind the veil of ignorance. Apparently you did like it then, you chose it. This is just what we saw here, right? This is the one that was left, and it's the one that translates to the difference principle, although it's not stated explicitly here. 
So every conceivable alternative, right? All of these alternatives here, as well as others, A, B, C, D, um, here, and others. So we've got meritocracy, free market capitalism, communism, socialism, egalitarianism, utilitarianism, feudal aristocracy, race-based economic systems. Okay, those are all things that you reject when you're in the original position from behind the veil of ignorance. So you can't just change your mind and accept one of them now that the veil's lifted. To do that is to make a decision based on morally irrelevant grounds. After all, that's the only difference between having the veil in place and having it lifted. The veil just screens off or eliminates morally arbitrary factors so that we can't be selfish or biased in a way that leads us to push for unjust principles. So it's almost like what you're doing is you're saying, oh yeah, yeah, my self-interested perspective behind the veil, I'm gonna go with the difference principle. Oh wait, now I'm in the real world and I don't have to do the morally right thing. I'm gonna consult all of these morally arbitrary, you know, considerations, like the fact that I'm actually quite well off in the real world, right? To do that is to do something um, unjust, Rawls thinks. Okay, so that's the end of it. This has gone a little bit long, um, but no more Rawls ever again. Thank God.